Good morning! Today I'm making a medieval style brooch out of pewter and casting it with soapstone. Specifically, I'm making what's called a hanger, which you can use to hang other tokens like this pretty little purse off the bottom. I'm starting out with my resource book, which is the third book in a really great series containing hundreds of medieval pewter finds, and I'm going to look for some inspiration images. I want to make a token for an event later this year at a place called the Flying Horseshoe Ranch, so I'm looking for examples of medieval wings and horseshoes. To begin with, I have a piece of soapstone that I've cut in half with a saw. You can see the rough saw marks as these lines across the stone, and I want to get rid of those lines. So I sand it using drywall sandpaper in a low grit. Sand until you can't see the lines anymore, and it looks fairly smooth. See how they're starting to go away here? Sanding has the additional benefit of flattening your stone, so make sure you're sanding on a very flat surface. You don't want to sand any weird curves or waves into it. I've drawn out my design on my piece of paper, and once I've decided on placement, I bend the corners of the paper around my stone to help line it up. In case I accidentally let go of the paper before I'm finished marking out the design, I don't have to worry about lining it back up again correctly, because the folds around the edge of the stone We'll just slide it right back into place. I'm poking through the paper into the soft soapstone, just enough with pressure to leave a little pinprick dent. Whenever you take the paper off, you can just barely see the lighter outline of the winged horseshoe design. To really make this stand out, I'm going to color in the places that I do not want to carve with a black marker. Now I can start carving away at the light parts of my design. I have a big collection of tools that I use, but honestly anything sharp or pointy will work. I even think that I'm using an eyeglass screwdriver here. You don't need anything special at all. I've made some channels to outline my design, and now I'm going to carve away the flat areas in between that raised outline. Sometimes I will switch between several different tools until I find one that fits in whatever little tiny area I'm working in. When you are done carving out your design, you need to cut a sprue for the metal to pour into that brooch cavity. I'm cutting with a curved precision knife blade, and this goes to show just how soft the stone is. I can remove a ton of material in a really short amount of time with this. After carving out one half of the sprue on the front mold, I can use the end of it to mark out the placement for the sprue on the back half of the mold. At this point, I should probably recommend that you're wearing some form of uh, face mask or eye protection or something, because I'm totally wearing both of these. Totally. Once your sprues are carved, you can now try pouring into your mold. We're nowhere near done at this point, but I like to try pouring at various points throughout my process and see how well it's going so far. It actually went surprisingly deep into the design. Often it takes a few more rounds of carving before I see very much metal into my project. As the stone mold heats up from getting filled in, it becomes more and more complete. Using my best pour so far, I trace around the branches on the back mold to help see where the sprue split needs to go. After carving out some of the back side of the sprue and adding some detail lines to the wings, I'm back at the Peter Pot to see how it's looking. And again, it's looking surprisingly complete for this early in the process. The design is almost completely filled out, the wings are casting very nicely, and there's a little bit of spotting around the open work holes that I'll need to fix, but we'll get there. I've now done a few more casts, and I'm seeing a problem area consistently pop up, which is the lower part of the horseshoe here. The wings are casting beautifully, so I can ignore them for now and just focus on fixing the bottom of the U-shape. Using one of the most complete casts I've gotten so far, I place it on the back half of the mold again and start carving thin lines down from the bottom loop. These are called vent lines and will help air escape from the mold as metal is being poured in through the top. You don't want air hanging out in the mold because it'll prevent metal from entering the areas where air is trapped. I'm also going to thicken the design a little bit here to allow more room for metal to flow into that trouble area. I'm also adding a vent hole in the middle of the horseshoe and adding some vent lines going towards this new air hole. This way, air can escape not only through the bottom of the mold, but also through this flat section in the middle. There are several examples of vent holes on medieval soapstone molds as well. They're really nifty. 
back to the casting pot. Hopefully those changes will help fix the problem area. Let's have a look. Oh, that turned out very nicely. Sorry it's so blurry, but it was a really sweet pour. Looks like the bottom loop didn't cast this time, but otherwise we're looking good. Of course, a couple of pours later, and I'm starting to see issues with the design not getting filled in. An additional trick I've learned is to use graphite powder on the mold. It seems to help the design get completely filled in and have less trapped air. Literally the only difference between my previous pour and this one is adding graphite to the surface. It got filled in so much more this time. Here I want to show you the difference between a first pour on a cold stone, where you can see sort of a bumpy surface on the bottom of the pin, and then here is a cast on the right where the stone was much warmer and the pewter took longer to cool in the mold. It has a smoother, shinier surface, less bumps and kind of patchy lookingness. Now I need to cast the pin or prong of the brooch. This is an old mold that I made previously, which has several prongs on the side, so I'm going to reuse it for this project. It is based on some pre-16th century stone molds that I've seen kind of like these. There is a hole on the side of the mold for me to insert a wooden dowel, and when I open the mold, you can see how the dowel creates a half circle form for the metal to cast around. I've been using the same stick for several hundred casts, and I don't see any noticeable scorching or burning. I think that the pewter is just too cool to harm the wood, compared to other metals that have to be heated to much, much higher temperatures. To use these pins, I need to separate the pin I want, in this case, only one pin turned out of the three here. So I'm going to separate that single one and clean off the extra metal flashing with these blue clippers. This pin was not made for this specific project, so it is a little bit too wide and too long. So I'm going to shorten the pin and file down the rough edges a little bit. The base of my pin is definitely way too wide to fit into my little brooch, so we need to slim it down a little bit by clipping away excess. Pewter is a really soft metal, so this is easy. Then filing away the rough edges evens everything else out. I can now bend the end of the pin into a little circle so it'll fit around the edge of the brooch. With our pin finished, we can try it out on this little hood. Just need to pinch the fabric a little bit and pin it through, and we've got a cute little penanular brooch. As I mentioned at the beginning, this particular style of penanular brooch is also called a hanger because the little hoop at the bottom here allows you to hang other pewter pendants or little charms. Here's a little painted purse that I made for an event a few years ago. I hope you all enjoyed seeing my little pewter project. Now that my mold is casting successfully, I just need to make a couple uh, hundred of these. Uh, if you have a pewter project of your own that you've made, I'd love to see a picture. Have a good night, guys!